Good morning. morning. It's so good to see everyone here that set their clocks back an hour. This is quite a week with a lot of things to think about, including that. We've got that done. Some of us had a football team that didn't do real well. That's on our minds. Uh, But whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. It doesn't matter that you got up this morning and put a good black skirt on and sat on the chair where your cat spent the night. And it doesn't matter if you were late today. It doesn't matter if you're home because you couldn't get here. We're glad you're here. One of the new traditions we have now is to greet each other in the name of Christ by standing and doing a wave. So please take a moment, stand, turn around, see who's behind you. Good morning. With all that's gone going on in our busy lives this week, it's a relief to be here with people we know and maybe some visitors as well. You are all welcome. It's All Saints Day. It's a day that we remember those who we love who have gone before us. Um, We maybe wore something or carry something specific like a locket that was your mother's or my father's book of common prayer. But what we always have with us are our memories of those loved ones. And as we open in prayer, I ask you to think of them in your heart today. Let us pray. Father, thank you for bringing each of us safely to this sanctuary, either in person or online. We surrender our lives to you in worship and praise, and as we gather, we remember the departed this All Saints Day, especially those we name in our hearts at this time. We invite your Holy Spirit to move in us, as we listen to your word and hear the message of Dr. Meg Ramey that she brings us today. Challenge and inspire us, teach and equip and walk with us, we pray. We ask all this in the name of your son, our savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Our call to worship this day, you will find in the bulletin and on the monitors, and it's from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. In the hymn, 
Oh, Worship the King. Betsy? Thank you, Betsy. I would like to take a moment to reintroduce you to Dr. Meg Ramey, who has been with us twice before. And when I met her in person today, it felt like we were old friends. And her husband, Duke, is with her as well. And please make them feel at home. Please join me now for the prayers of the people. After each prayer, we will observe a moment of silence in which you can call to mind and in your heart those people who are incidents who are heavy on your heart and you would like to lift to the Lord. We pray for the church throughout the world, for all church leaders and clergy, for St. Thomas and for Pastor Dan Schmidt while on his study leave. We pray, for the, um, we pray for the country and our government leaders and all public servants and loving God, we ask that you watch over this nation in this upcoming election. We pray for those who are ill, that they may find comfort in you and regain their health. And we lift up all healthcare workers Grant them protection as they put the needs of others before their own. We recognize your goodness and pray that we might act from a mindset of abundance, sharing our resources to help those in need. And we pray for people dealing with adversity, be it illness, separation or any other kind, and especially for those whose needs have been made known to us. Mary Jane, Joan, Chaz, the Heister, Heister family, Tracy, Bonnie, Brandon and Jamie, Noah, Dylan and Ryan, Jim and Sharon, Kathy, Rachel, Jim, Betty, Gail, Lynn, John, and Ken. 
May the Holy Spirit hold them and comfort them in love, and may Christ's ever-present spirit sustain them. O oh God, our Father, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. you can mail them to the church office or also go online. There's a process there as well. Let's consider God's faithful, his generous provision, and bring our thanks. We're grateful, Lord, for your good care. We ask your blessing now on these offerings that they might be used to your glory for the work of your kingdom. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Checking to see if you can hear me. Is it working all right? All right, great. Well, thank you for having me back. Our first we're going to read the scripture today, which comes from Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. That's how the NIV translates today's text. Well, Given that Dan has left me to preach on the Sunday before election, you might imagine that the sermon will be about the problem of folks not practicing what they preach and the need for laws to be applied fairly to all, how one set of rules can't be used for one, whether they're individuals, whether they're on the other side of the aisle and not applied to yourself or your side, and arguing that it's okay to do it because the ends justify the means is not only bad ethical reasoning, it's also the excuse in every story you've ever read by the villain, right? But that's not what I'm going to preach on today because I don't think that's what the text is actually saying. I think the NIV's interpretive insertion of practice what you preach was not a good translation of the Greek 
and it's not representative of the problem that Jesus was addressing then or warning us about today. Surprise, right? The real issue was not that the scribes and Pharisees, and hereafter I'm just going to say Pharisees, but you can know I mean both sets of groups, and I do not mean, neither did Jesus, nor did Matthew mean, all Jews. He's talking about a specific group of leaders who had specific problems that we're going to talk about today. So they're not talking about all Jews. They were Jews, right? So they're just speaking to themselves. Well, they're prophetically speaking to their people. So, as I was saying, the real issue was not that the Pharisees had trouble practicing what they preached. Nowhere else in Matthew's Gospel does it ever suggest that the Pharisees were not following their own interpretations of the Mosaic Law. Consider previous run-ins between Pharisees and Jesus just over the issue of proper Sabbath observance. First, the Pharisees complain about Jesus' disciples who are picking grain on the Sabbath. Then they're angry with Jesus because he's healing on the Sabbath. The reason they're shocked and appalled by what's happening is because Jesus and his disciples weren't following their Sabbath observance rules that the Pharisees had preached. The Pharisees, of course, would never profane the Sabbath by working on it and convert and controvert their own teachings, right? No, the real issue was that the Pharisees did practice what they preached. It's just that their preaching wasn't always the best. Now, you may be wondering, why in the world would Jesus tell his disciples earlier in verse 3 to, quote, do whatever they teach you and follow it? Was Jesus really telling them to follow the teaching of the very people that he'd been opposing and refuting throughout the whole Gospel of Matthew? The simple is, answer is no, he wasn't. The more complicated answer is that in a largely illiterate world in which copies of the scriptures were not readily available, these religious leaders functioned as the gatekeepers of the Torah because they could read and they had access to Torah scrolls. So when Jesus says that they sit on the seat of Moses, he was acknowledging that they were in a very powerful religious and social position. To learn the law, especially after Jesus was gone, his disciples would need to listen to these teachers who had memorized the words of Moses. Therefore, what Jesus was telling his disciples, and this would be a better translation, is that they should do and keep whatever they say, which was the Torah, the words of Moses, but his disciples should not do according to the works that the Pharisees were doing. In other words, while the Pharisees might speak Torah, Jesus did not think that they did Torah correctly anyway. For while their original intention to keep the law was good, it was the execution that was problematic. And believe me, the Pharisees were obsessed with keeping the law. And, you know, if you believed as they did, that all the horrors that they had suffered in the past, Assyrian exile, Babylonian exile, occupation by the Persians, the Greeks, and now the Romans, that all of these events were curses, that were brought on by them breaking God's covenant law, well, you too might be pretty anxious about not transgressing the law again, right? Strict adherence to the law was what would keep them and their followers safe from God's wrath. So, you memorize all 613 of the laws in the Torah, and then you try to strictly observe them. For example, if you're worried about making sure that you tithe a tenth of all your possessions, that anxiety might lead you to actually start counting out a tenth of all your spices. Can you imagine having to weigh out dill and mint and cumin to get exactly a tenth of all of those? But what if there were unintentional transgressions of the law? Well, to guard against even accidental infringements, the Pharisees began to surround those 600 plus laws with even more specific rules of interpretation and application to daily life. In other words, they fenced in the law. 
or to put it in terms of a parable from one of my favorite Jesus novels. It's called uh, The Hidden Years by Neil Boyd. There once was a beautiful meadow, and in that meadow there was a shepherd, because there's always a shepherd in every parable, right? And the sheep were grazing happily, munching on the green grass and roaming freely in this beautiful meadow. However, this fine shepherd was concerned for the safety of his flock. What if wolves came in and devoured the flock? So to protect them, and of course himself, from his master's wrath, should this happen, he built a hedge around the meadow. Well, that kept out the wolves, but what about the occasional fox or a badger that could still squeeze through that hedge? It wasn't enough. So he planted another hedge inside the hedge, and then another hedge inside that hedge, and then on and on until that beautiful meadow was a sea of hedges. And these hedges were so impressive that people would come from miles and miles around to gaze at how wondrous all these hedges were. Meanwhile, his flock, now fenced in and protected from all those predators, continued in perfect safety until they starved to death. Good intention, bad execution, with very unhealthy consequences. Well, maybe that's why Jesus was never impressed with additional fences. You'd think that he would be, because after all, it sure does look pious. But in chapter 23, we learn just what Jesus thinks of the Pharisees' attempts to build these extra hedges. He says, quote, They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. When they make converts, he says they, quote, make them twice as much a child of hell as they themselves are. He calls these fence fence builders blind guides, fools, snakes, a brood of vipers, and hypocrites. Again and again throughout Matthew's gospel, Jesus specifically warns his disciples to beware of the Pharisees' teaching. But of course, the Pharisees are not the only ones who like to fence in the law. We all have that tendency sometimes, because why else would Jesus warn us not to, quote, do as they do, right? In my younger Christian days, I was obsessed with keeping the right rules and having the right theology. Mine was not a religion of freedom, but of fences. I wanted to know exactly where the lines were, what boundaries should not be crossed, And like many Christian teenagers in the 90s, I attended a youth group that was focused on the one major purity law that you were not to break. You may not see it in your Ten Commandments, but I swear it's there. Thou shalt not have premarital sex. And that's what we heard about over and over again. So to keep from transgressing that law, we put fences around fences, and we had discussions upon discussions about how far was too far, and what types of physical affection were permitted while dating, and about which types of clothing were too revealing, because of course you didn't want your brothers to stumble. So we tried so hard to be uber pure, and we were proud of it. I can even remember one summer in college while I was working at a Christian youth camp, I got to teach the class on godly relationships. And I used the following visual demonstration. I would tape off a line on the ground, and I'd call up the biggest guy in the class to come be my assistant, and I would tell him to stand right at the edge of that line while I tried to push him over and not to let me push him over. Well, inevitably, all the guys always fell, and they would fall over the line, right? So we'd try that experiment again. We'd back up several feet from the line, and I'd try to push him over again. Same experiment. But this time it was much, much harder, nearly impossible for me to be able to push him over the line. I would then tell the class, if you back up from that line of premarital sex, right, this was the analogy, and establish other rules for yourself of how far is too far, you'll be much less likely to cross that line. The logic was impeccable. Meg the Pharisee laid down additional rules. Talk about fencing it in, right? motivated by fear and self-protection, and then tried to impose those heavy burdens on others. And my, how people, especially other children's parents, celebrated how holy and pious I was with all my extra fences. 
Well, what was wrong with this, you may be asking, especially if you're a parent. Well, four things. First, sometimes you become so enamored with the adulation that you receive for being so pious and so concerned with keeping that white picket fence appearance that your focus shifts almost exclusively to your outward performance. And if you're not careful over time, your inner soul and your outer mask may have little to do with one another. And that's precisely what Jesus meant when he calls them hypocrites. In Matthew, hypocrites does not mean practicing, not practicing what you preach. It does mean having a discrepancy between one's inner nature and outer appearance. Which makes perfect sense because this word comes from Greek drama where they had the practice of wearing masks. The audience knew that the actors, the hypocrites, were performing. They knew that the mask on the outside was not the same as the person underneath. Second, if the inside is good, then the fences become irrelevant because whatever is inside will always have a way of coming out, no matter what fences you build to try to hold it back or to prop it up. Fences fail. And sure, you might be able to hide your heart or even some of your actions from others, but you can't hide them from yourself and you can't hide them from God. So you know if what's inside is broken and rotting, that's what needs to be fixed first. Fences aren't going to help. Third, sometimes you become so focused on the fences themselves that you forget about the more important matters, the actual people that they were meant to protect. Remember those starving sheep? That's why Jesus would say, quote, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. He also said, suppose one of you has only one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath. Will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a human being than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. What Jesus could see clearly and the Pharisees could see not was that they had become so focused on the more trivial matters, those that enhance their outward piety while fencing others out, that they had ignored the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. As Jesus put it so memorably, they strained out a gnat but swallowed a camel. And finally, fourth, fences that are originally erected for protection often turn into boundary markers and draw lines between who is in and who is out. And the ritual fences that the Pharisees constructed brought glory to themselves, established themselves as God's in crowd, but many of them were heavy burdens for ordinary people to bear. They developed an intricate religious system that was difficult to follow and sometimes even economically burdensome, and the people were damned if they did not follow the minutia to the letter. The problem with fences is that they fence people out. Now, I told you earlier a story about when I fenced myself in. Now, let me tell you another one about when I was once fenced out. When I was in college and at the height of my purity obsession, I remember admiring Christian speakers as they, as they extolled their own private fences. I remember one who said he would never be alone in any room with any woman who wasn't his wife. Oh, how pious. Oh, how righteous he sounded. Later, when I started working for a Christian ministry after college, I was on a team that included a couple. And I distinctly remember one day driving back uh, alone with the husband in his car after a morning service, and it was around lunchtime, and out of the blue, he announced to me, I'm sorry that we can't stop for food, but I made a vow that I would never eat any meal alone with another woman who wasn't my wife. Did I mention he said this while we were alone in his car together? <laughs> no doubt he left that experience feeling pious, with his arbitrary fence, I was left feeling dirty and objectified. Whereas before, I had only ever thought of myself as his coworker, as his mentee, as his friend, as his sister in Christ. 
In a moment, I was reduced to one thing, a temptation, all because I was a woman. My gender became my defining quality. I was an object, so to speak, that only fell into two categories, either kosher or off limits. His pious fence came at my expense. Well, I won't dwell on how that experience changed the dynamics of our relationship or on how another male colleague who was not a tempting object became more um, of his friend and benefited more from his mentorship. What's more important to point out is that while he was being hypervigilant about a self-created and arbitrary fence, he was also ignoring the much weightier matters in his own marriage. Using his work as a pretense, he often neglected his wife and child. He always had time to help everyone else except them. And I watched as she slipped further away into depression, and the chasm between them widened. Privately, she admonished me to be very careful about who I married and to watch how he treated his family that he already had. Outwardly, he tried to present the facade of a perfect Christian couple. Well, as Jesus would say, you can whitewash tombs and you can clean the outsides of cups all you want, but if the inter it's the internal state that matters. And when the inside is healthy and good and loving, no fences are required. Or as Paul would later put it in a letter to Titus, to the pure, all things are pure. And what need is there of fences? And Jesus knew that. That's why instead of erecting fences, Jesus offered freedom. Instead of additional burdens hard to bear, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Instead of worrying about 613 commandments and additional ones thrown on top, he boiled them all down to two. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. With these two touchstones to hand and the Spirit to guide them, Jesus set his disciples free to, quote, bind and loose the law as appropriate. And this interpretive power was passed on to the church. However, too many times we focus on Jesus' first commandment to the exclusion of the second. But when we don't love our neighbor, the love of God becomes something else. It becomes self-serving, self-aggrandizing, something that fences us in and keeps others out, something dangerous even. And heaven help anyone who tries to tear down those fences. When Jesus challenged the Pharisees' Sabbath fences, they were so irate that they walked out of the synagogue and began plotting how they would kill him. It's the first time we're told in Matthew that they wanted to kill Jesus. And it's in response to his love and compassion for his neighbor. And if you're at a loss to try to figure out how you can love your neighbor, well, Jesus offers some excellent examples just two chapters later. He says, when they're hungry, feed them. When they're thirsty, give them something to drink. When they're strangers, welcome them in. When they're naked, give them clothes. When they're sick, take care of them. When they're in prison, visit them. And woe to us if we start erecting our own purity fences around Jesus' instructions, deciding which neighbors are worthy of charity, which is another word for love. I'll leave you with one final thought from one of my favorite uh, preachers, Andrew Pryor. He's from Australia. I wish you could hear his accent read this instead. He talks about the freedom that comes without living with fences. He says, and I quote, the only protection, the only vigilance I find that works is to remove the fences altogether, to trust to faith that I will not be lost to God or go astray if I simply love without fences, because real love of neighbor is to remove the barriers between us. For in its essence, love is mercy, it is compassion, it is feeling with. 
loving as I love myself, first of all, to be alongside, especially alongside those who are least in society, and especially alongside those the Pharisaical me would despise. I cannot fence my faith and still love. The command to love God and to love our neighbor is not an imposition, it is grace. It is an invitation to begin the path to freedom. For when the fences are removed, I make the great discovery that there can be no pride. Alongside, unseparated, eyes open at last, I see that I am the same simply human. We are all brothers and sisters. My heart is softened because I see what I have always hidden from myself. We are all human. I am no worse. I am no better. I can forgive myself. I do not have to judge others. God loves me for me as God loves them. I do not have to be better or special. There is nothing to fear. Amen. As we prepare to remember the Lord through communion, let us pray. 
Holy God, we praise and bless you for creation and the gift of life. We thank you for your abiding love, which brings us close to you, the source of all blessing. We thank you for revealing your, your will for us in the giving of the law and in the preaching of the prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, born of Mary, into this life that we know, heralded by angels and greeted by humble shepherds, Jesus took upon himself our suffering and accepted the pain of death at the hands of those whom he loved. We rejoice that in a perfect victory over the grave you raised Christ with power to become sovereign in your realm. We celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit to gather your church through which your work may be done in the world and through which we share the gift of eternal life. With the faithful, in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, and broke the bread. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. By your Holy Spirit, consecrate these gifts of bread and wine and bless us that as we receive them at this table, we may offer you our faith and praise. We may be united with Christ and with one another, and we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and gives thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. Let us pray as the one who died for us taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now the bread and cup, which I believe everyone has as well. Eat this, for it is the body of Christ broken for you. And drink this, for it is the blood of Christ shed for you. We thank you, God, 
for inviting us to this table where we remember the Lord who out of love died and with power was raised from the grave. We thank you for sending the Spirit who guides us as we follow the risen Lord. Deepen our faith, broaden our love for one another, and help us live to your praise and glory. This we ask through Jesus, our Savior. Amen.
Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Savior Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip, equip you with everything good that you may do God's will, working in you that which is pleasing in God's sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.